Why do people keep falling for things that don't work? When I started writing this, I intended it to be a fairly short, focused video about a specific mental trap that people fall into, but as I got into it, four months of not having written a script started to flow and it's kind of morphed into a sprawling magnum opus of some of my biggest frustrations with the state of science and medicine and frankly, human civilization today. Could I have made it shorter? Almost certainly yes, but if I really want to be taken seriously as a pseudo-intellectual content creator, can I afford not to make a deep dive meandering video essay to close out 2022? So sit back and hopefully enjoy I use the word loosely. This video is sponsored by GiveWell, and in the spirit of Christmas, I'm going to be using my fee to donate to charity. Please do watch till the end to find out how to make a donation that genuinely counts. I'm really pleased to be working with GiveWell on this, so do stay tuned. I talk about the different cognitive biases on this channel fairly frequently that we all exhibit. And what's interesting about them is that everybody is affected from a medfluencer fresh out of med school trying to build their wellness brand to a supplement hawking podcaster whose only medical training is watching a celebrity chiropractor's Instagram to a credentialed professor of medicine in full-time academia. We're all susceptible. Things like confirmation bias, where you ignore evidence that contradicts your belief and place more value on evidence that supports it. I believe that shining infrared light at my scrotum increases my testosterone level. And there's this very compelling study in the Journal of Infrared Scrotal Studies demonstrating this cutting edge science. Yes, I am aware that there are multiple studies contradicting this, but frankly, a lot of them had funding from the visible light spectrum industry and big UV. Then there's misattributing causation between two events that simply happened consecutively. My 93-year-old great-aunt got a COVID jab and then died three weeks later. And <laughs> 93-year-olds don't just die. Or there's novelty bias, where a treatment or a device is thought to be better simply because it's new. N not now, Elizabeth. I'm Please, can you just can you just go away and just come back a bit later, maybe in 11 years? Sorry, she's got a thing for Indian guys. And who am I to kink shame? But today I want to tell you about one bias that I've observed, especially during the pandemic, which I don't think has a snappy name that I'm aware of, but flies under the radar. So I don't think it gets the attention that it deserves. And I see it everywhere especially among health influencers and lifestyle medics who think differently to other doctors and aren't in the pocket of Big Pharma. Or those who are in the pocket of Big Pharma and make a career out of being cheerleaders for the latest medications and gizmos from multinational pharmaceutical or device corporations. You probably don't see that second category as much because their target audience isn't the general public but other medical professionals, and so they maybe don't get the same level of scrutiny but perhaps most interestingly, I've seen this bias demonstrated by both sides of the gaping chasm that has opened up in society um, during the pandemic as both the it's just a cold bro carnivore ice bath testosterone crew and the close the schools, mask the babies, booster shots in perpetuity, don't question anything Pfizer say crew both make the exact same mental mistake. I enjoy this topic because it involves two of my favourite things, the philosophy of science and epistemology, which is really the study of knowledge. Hey, hey, I see you reaching to choose a different video. If those sound a bit obtuse to you, you're right, they can be. So let me see if I can convey what I mean in an interesting way. And I'm only going to spend the first couple of minutes on this anyway. If you get to the end of the video and think that I did a bad job, sincerely do let me know that this was boring. But if you really want to make that observation in a scientific way, you really need to watch the video in its entirety several times to show your responses are reproducible from several different devices to correct for confounding, and ideally watch it again free of adverts over on Nebula to ensure that you're not conflicted with any financial conflicts of interest. That's just science. Now allow me to start with a little preface to the video. The demarcation problem 
is the name given to a question that philosophers have asked for thousands of years. How do you differentiate between science and non-science? Now you can imagine through history this was challenging. A holy man staring at the heavens, plotting the trajectories of bodies moving across the sky, was doing early science, but he undoubtedly held unscientific beliefs that the handful of stars that were moving independently were gods or spirits. Or consider the alchemist dedicating her life to the ancient practice of trying to purify or convert materials such as gold. Although she was mistaken in her beliefs, her field would grow into chemistry centuries after her death. So fast forward to the modern era of science, with the scientific method firmly established, and it should be easier, right? Well, enter famous 20th century philosopher of science Karl Popper, whose illustrious and prolific career I don't hope to summarise here, but he's perhaps most famous for one thing. Popper proposed that science isn't about what you can prove, because many things can have supporting evidence without being science. The classic example given in this context is swans. I may tell you that swans are always white, and I can produce a thousand white swans to support my theory, but you simply need to find one black swan to show that I was wrong. Note Popper is not talking about what is false or true, but the claim that I made was falsifiable. There is evidence that can be produced to negate it. And that's how science moves forwards, by making claims that are falsifiable. Let's assume you're one of those whack job Fruit Loops who believes that the world is round, and I believe it's flat. I can show you the flat horizon to prove my point, but you can simply take me into space to show me a round Earth and I will accept your evidence. Please, somebody, take me into space. However, believing in God, for example, is not falsifiable. You can produce evidence that God exists, like somebody uh, asked something in their prayers and their prayers were answered, but there's nothing that I can do, there's nothing I can produce to disprove the existence of God. So that's not science. So far, so good. We have science and non-science. But it's not as easy as that. In fact, there are many criticisms of Popper's work, which I'm not going to go into here. Instead, I'll present a simplified version to introduce to you the area that I want to explore with you uh, today, which is pseudoscience. Of course, you've heard this term before many times, especially on Twitter, where people allege that anything they don't believe in is pseudoscience. But in fact, it has a specific meaning. And as, as we've already said, making an exact prediction that can be disproven or falsified is science. If I drop a hammer, then it will fall to the ground. No ifs, no buts. If the hammer floats off to the side, I can't wave the result away and say, oh, it's challenging to read the gravity cards and you should definitely still trust me. But of course, that's what people like psychics do. They make vague predictions to give themselves wiggle room. A shaman may make an outlandish claim like, if I do a dance, my crops will grow. Or someone may say, if you sign up to a new age, goopy ayahuasca retreat, your life will improve and your husband will stop cheating on you. None of those things can be tested. They're not falsifiable. That's not science. And nobody thinks that's science. They're not pretending to be scientific. They're not invoking the language of science or claiming a logical process. But in the middle of these, two obvious examples of science and non-science is a huge area of all manner of thought processes and belief systems which wear the clothes of science. Now, I do realise that you can shift many of the topics that I mention hitherto and henceforth from non-science into pseudoscience with some degree of subjectivity. But for me, examples of pseudoscience are the study of UFOs, the search for ancient aliens, Myers-Briggs personality tests, healing crystals, hypnotherapy, handwriting and analysis, phrenology, intelligent design. Fields which use scientific language, they may perform experiments using apparently scientific equipment, they may publish those results in sciency looking journals, have mechanisms or pathways that may appear plausible. We'll hear that word plenty of times in this video. In short, they are dressed up like science in order to borrow its respectability and cachet. Bring it more to my field as a doctor, things like homeopathy and chiropractic are classic examples. They have their own textbooks, expert guidelines, they have all the trappings of clinical medicine with a consultation room, chemicals or specific treatments, complicated names of things, activators, they require years of study, their practitioners who call themselves doctors, adding to the legitimacy, believe what they're doing works based on mechanisms that make sense to them, and yet both of them are 
complete superstition. They're nonsense. They are perfect examples of pseudoscience. They don't ask you to believe in some spirit or swear a blood oath to the blood god. No, they're grounded in serious logical thought. And so they take in people who could clearly spot a psychic for being a fake, but they are fooled by these more legitimate looking fields. Homeopathy uses the belief that like cures like, that small doses of something harmful can somehow help. And chiropractic is based on the belief that imbalances occur in the body and can be treated by manipulating the skeleton. And even as I say them out loud, they sound insane. But hey, you know, quantum physics sounds insane. And most of us believe that. So assume you believe those concepts to be true, you can imagine how all the various treatments they administer seem to be scientific, based on that framework. There is a logic to it, albeit a faulty one, which is in contrast to, say, a witch doctor invoking magic. Different cultures do pseudoscience in different ways. When a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner tells you snorting powdered tiger todger will make you an alpha chad, they don't talk about boosting your immune system or rebalancing your microbiome as is fashionable in the West today. Their framework revolves around the flow of qi, the life force. Again, if you believe in that system, it might seem like what you're doing is scientific. I'd kind of have more respect if they just, instead of relying on pseudoscience, just went full Charlie Sheen and said, stop being a beta cuck, eat the goddamn tiger penis and become an omnipotent tiger blood warlock. But you know, I find this all a bit sad. It's sad that we can't just say something feels nice. We have to invent some pseudoscientific argument to give it legitimacy. Taking a bunch of herbal pills in the morning with a turmeric smoothie can make somebody feel like they are taking charge of their health. Having a hot sauna or a cold shower can make you feel fantastic. In the case of chiropractic, having somebody fuss over you for an hour, massage you, crack some joints which provides a little temporary relief, and offer a calm, caring interaction feels nice. Acupuncture, Reiki, aromatherapy, reflexology, cupping, and so on, all involve tender human contact. Somebody paying you attention, listening, offering something soothing. It's okay to say that these things have real value and feel nice without resorting to seeing them through the lens of science, especially when modern conventional medicine often can't offer any of these things. The problems arise when you start trying to give some quack explanation as to why these things have an effect by inventing uh, this vague concept of scientific holistic wellness or a hodgepodge of metaphysical and medical terms, which can lead to people viewing them as inherently active cures and more effective than clinically proven medical therapies and often paying with their money or worse, their lives. This is a really silly analogy for this concept. But remember, in the original Star Wars trilogy, the Force was this mysterious, wondrous, magical thing, deeply spiritual and seriously cool. Everybody wanted to be a Jedi and master the Force. George Lucas clearly took a leaf out of the alternative medicine apologist's uh, playbook when he was making the prequels and took all the magic out of the Force by boiling it down to some blood test to measure your midichlorian microbiome levels. Almost a forerunner to the microbiome testing startups that have proliferated today, although the Star Wars blood test was actually useful. So far, I don't think I've said anything that most viewers would disagree with, nor anything that you've probably not heard before. Which brings me to the main assertion of the video. These have all been fairly easy examples to choose. They're the faves of the debunkers. And debunking ineffective alternative medicines, homeopathy, chiropractic, essential oils, colonic irrigation, juice cleanses, Gwyneth Paltrow's entire existence, and so on, is important. I don't want to knock any of that because it can help many people fooled by these ideas. It's just maybe not my forte. I think other people do it better, more entertainingly. So what I want to do is to pick on pseudoscience that has so successfully adopted the patina of science that no one even thinks that they are anything but science. Bioplausibility is a fairly self-explanatory neologism to describe if something is biologically plausible. 
If you ingest a compound that has antimicrobial properties against bacteria, otherwise known as an antibiotic, it is biologically plausible that this will kill bacteria in your body. If you place ice on a hot swollen joint, it is biologically plausible that this will reduce inflammation. If somebody claims to be able to heal you just by their hands hovering above your body or making the gentlest of contact, it is not biologically plausible that this will do anything directly to your insides. If you ingest a solution that has been diluted so many times that there is no trace of the original chemical present, it is not biologically plausible that this will do anything. So bioplausibility is important. It is often the starting point for much medical research. But time and time again, people mistake the first step for the end of the journey. My PhD research was in a field called remote ischemic preconditioning, and it's very typical of the vast, vast majority of medical therapies. It showed tremendous promise in laboratory testing, in mice and, and similar kinds of experiments, where it reduced the size of heart attacks. But in the real world, with a blinded, randomized, prospective control trial, which sadly, especially for me, didn't show a meaningful effect. Now, of course, there are many things uh, to be taken into account, but if you look at all potential research targets, many show great promise in preliminary lab bench testing. Most of those are jettisoned at just phase one clinical trials. A tiny percentage makes it to the market, and even then, the effect sizes of most therapies are modest. Not to mention that many are subsequently taken off the market sometime later for actually not being very good or even being harmful. You've heard me say this many times before, that medical history is littered with therapies that turned out to be duds. Belief in a bio-plausible mechanism is not enough. I started this video by saying that I didn't know if this particular faith in bio-plausibility had a snappy name to go alongside the other biases, but so perhaps we can call it a mechanistic bias or a mechanistic fallacy. It's never been on display as clearly, in my opinion, as it has during the pandemic, especially when people unfamiliar with clinical trials have started pontificating online and been elevated to some sort of expert. A little side note, you've probably heard of hard versus soft sciences. Soft sciences are essentially the social sciences, things like sociology, economics, anthropology, linguistics. Hard sciences are maths, physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. Now, the last thing I want to do is to throw any shade at, in, towards the social sciences because they are tremendously interesting, very useful, and of course, entirely legitimate fields of study in their own rights. That should all go without saying. But it's safe to say that they fail to fulfill the often quoted hallmarks of science, of which falsifiability is just one. I'll, I'll put the rest on the screen or something. Things like reproducibility and experimental testing of hypotheses. I don't think it's particularly useful that we have expanded science to encompass almost any field of study. Again, I don't know if this is true, but perhaps because people feel that they need that badge for their field to be taken seriously. And I just mention this because science has a specific meaning. And I feel that hard versus soft would have been better suited to describing the data rather than the field itself. But let's instead think of clean versus messy science instead. In physics, for example, I can use a pen and paper or a computer to model very complex um, systems. I can plot the exact path of spacecraft interacting with multiple gravitational fields. In chemistry, I can react two chemicals together and I can you know, make pretty precise predictions about what's going to happen. But when it comes to biology, things get quite a lot messier. Where the clean ends and the messy begins is impossible to answer. And yes, physicists, chemists, I know that there are quantum theory, biochemistry, nuclear chemistry, lots of fields which have messy data sets as well. And that's my point, is there is this no man's land between real and fake science, between hard and soft science, between clean and messy science. In the cresting waves, as the sea of stochastic chaos washes against the beach of logic and mechanistic models. Without doubt, what exists in this liminal space is absolutely science as according to Popper, 
but so incredibly complex that we simply aren't able to model it in the same way as we would when we're planning the building of a bridge or the James Webb Space Telescope. In short, human beings are tremendously messy, and every time we think of them as models that we can predict with any degree of confidence, even the smartest of mechanistic thinkers has been humbled. If you're interested in sort of medical news, you've probably heard the term randomised controlled trial so many times it's lost all meaning. But there's a reason that it's a mantra among doctors who believe in evidence and not mechanisms. Because that is how we prove if things work. Not by modelling, not by lab bench testing, not by marketing, not by expert opinion. Randomised controlled trials are medicine's secret source. They are the basis upon which we hang our entire profession. It is what has allowed us to move away from bloodletting and lobotomies. Let's explore some examples. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to start with Covid. We've seen doctors, but also those from other scientific backgrounds like Brett Weinstein, for example, fall into the mechanistic fallacy by obsessively going on about ivermectin, others about hydroxychloroquine, long blog posts and Twitter threads about the molecular mechanism they would attack the virus. Dozens and dozens of clinical trials later, useless. Others pushed remdesivir or convalescent plasma, allowing belief in their mechanisms to rapidly expand usage until they were proven to be essentially useless too, and very expensive. We've seen physicists and engineers writing reams and reams about masks, modelling airflow and of course assuming that humans are robots with perfect mask technique and perfect masks. We've seen doctors and scientists demonstrating what can really only be described as magical thinking by saying things like they will always wear a mask in public except when they're eating or if they need to take a selfie when they'll hold their breath. Somehow this makes sense to them based on their mechanistic thinking. If you want to lose faith in humanity, just go to Twitter and search for hold breath mask off to see what apparently intelligent human beings believe about the spread of respiratory infections. Unlike the pharmacological interventions, I can't actually show you decent randomised trial data for masking because there's precious little of it. A major medical news outlet ran an interview in November 2022, this is 2022, not 2020, with some of the Covid experts who said things like, I carry a CO2 monitor and if my phone pings I put on a mask, or others saying I won't allow unvaccinated relatives to come to Thanksgiving. Twitter accounts have been set up specifically just to scold doctors who are pictured not wearing masks at social occasions or, you know, outside. The same level of mechanistic thinking led to logical conclusions that school children should wear masks, when this had never been tested to take into account all the blindingly obvious factors that mean children are not like adults, from how the masks fit them, to how well they're going to adhere to wearing their mask, and of course their own risk from the virus. Now please note, I'm not saying that masks, especially a well-fitted N95 or similar, do nothing. That's not my point. But what these online science influencers propose only makes sense in a fantasy world, not reality. I did something I hate doing. I watched some of my old videos, uh, and back in 2020, like most of us, I was willing to give the mechanistic argument for masking um, the benefit of the doubt. But this far down the line, we should have more than just a mechanistic argument. Whatever Covid interventions you can think of, chances are it turned out to be far less effective than initially thought, and that just makes Covid like pretty much every other disease. With some notable exceptions, of course, the main one being the vaccine, which was tremendously effective, but again was the victim of people layering their own bias on top to underestimate the importance and safety in at-risk populations, or to overestimate the importance and safety in very low-risk populations, like children. But I've made a separate video about that, so I won't go into it here. And it's not just the treatments that are misjudged based on simplistic mechanistic thinking. Again, opposing parties exhibit the same mistake when one group attributes anything that happens after Covid to Covid, and another group attributes everything that happens after the vaccine to the vaccine. Both will come up with some sort of vaguely bioplausible reason, cheered on by medics in both camps who um, give them these kinds of ideas, to explain what they're 
claiming. And this is where a little knowledge is a dangerous thing because when you know a bit about metabolic pathways or neurotransmitters or cells or whatever, it's actually easier to concoct something that sounds reasonable to confirm your beliefs. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, to the COVID zealots, we have the manfluencers, the testosterone tribe, the liver kings. Beliefs common to this group are the benefits of an all-meat diet or keto, testosterone, and a metric ton of wildly expensive supplements that they take every day. Oh, for those of you unfamiliar with the metric system, you will of course be familiar with the most stable radioisotope of iridium. So if you take a thousand moles of that and add it to the mass of a US short ton, then you get a metric ton. I hope that helps. The reputable science faces of this way of thinking are regular guests on podcasts like Joe Rogan's. Let's start with diets. Now, as I've said before on this channel, I rarely talk about diet aside from perhaps summarizing the occasional research paper because I find so much of the discourse uh, surrounding diet online incredibly toxic. Plus, I'm not a dietitian. I am not trying to depict myself as an expert. My understanding of the field is always going to be the main headlines or analyzing a study's methodology rather than the minutiae. You, of course, already know that diets on the whole have a very poor success rate. So if somebody tries a few and one works for them, that's great and agonizing over which is best for a number of surrogate markers of success is fairly meaningless to that person. But ideally, we shouldn't be choosing a diet based solely on weight loss, because that's just one marker. And the diet's overall effect should be considered. But let's say somebody has lost weight on a keto diet, for example, and they're feeling good. Without getting into sort of blood work and things like that, that's great. Now, the way they will have lost weight will have been through caloric restriction. The way every diet causes weight loss is by reducing the number of calories you're consuming. That's it. And what different diets offer is a different way of doing that. The magic mechanism by which ketones apparently produce special effects in the body has never been demonstrated outside of some very specific um, and limited medical scenarios. It's not ketosis that is having some important superimposed effect. It's a reduction in the calories you're consuming. The same is true for the carnivore diet, low carb, low fat, paleo, pescatarian, vegetarian, vegan, whatever. If you're just concerned with weight loss, they all work in the same way by reducing calories. And yet you will find no end of websites and podcasts, videos going deep into the possible mechanistic ways that a specific diet exerts its effect. The same goes for intermittent fasting, which I myself was a fairly devout adherent to for about three years. I fasted almost every day for 22 hours. But when studies showed that uh, there really isn't a major effect from that length of fast, except for caloric restriction, I decided to adopt a less severe tactic. The fasting wasn't the main thing that it offered. It was just a s providing a way to reduce your calorie intake. Again, I'm not suggesting that all diets are the same uh, in terms of all the other benefits that they offer. But don't believe the talk of speeding up your metabolism or fat burning foods. Nutrition and diet, of course, is perhaps ground zero for the mechanistic fallacy, or it certainly was until COVID came along and took its dubious crown. Not a day goes by without some health influencer trying to sell you something to ingest in order to make you a better version of yourself than you are now albeit a slightly poorer one. Or just open any crappy health website to find some Schrodinger's foodstuff or drink, simultaneously the cure and cause of cancer. Can't I just have a nice cup of tea or coffee without being bombarded with articles about the antioxidant properties of green tea or the cancer-fighting properties of caffeine? Even if things like this are spotted in a petri dish in a lab, they're effectively like pissing in a force eight hurricane when it comes to the effect they'll have on your overall health. They're snowballs in an avalanche. Diet peddling grifters is an easy segue into the absolutely wild and utterly unhinged world of supplements. 
There are too many powders and potions on the unregulated market to address, and I think anyone with common sense can detect plenty of the ones that are worth avoiding. But let's concentrate on one of the most common, and perhaps one that you would assume is the least controversial, because it appears in mainstream medical guidelines as well, vitamin D supplementation. Now, unlike many supplements, vitamin D tablets are pretty harmless. So what could I possibly have against the advice to take it? Well, nothing. You can take it if you like. But we have once again fallen into not one, but two cognitive biases. For many people, vitamin D's apparent vital role in preventing COVID has been their first introduction to the cult that surrounds it, as popularized by medical YouTubers, Instagram doctors, podcasters, Joe Rogan again, he said that COVID wouldn't be such a big deal and vaccines probably wouldn't be necessary if everybody was taking vitamin D. When they got data, and the data was pretty clear, that a large percentage of the people in the ICU for COVID were deficient in vitamin D, 100% will increase the power of your immune system. But also, some medical organizations have recommended taking vitamin D as a possible mitigating factor to avoid serious infection. It truly crossed the divide, with vaccine skeptics saying vaccines wouldn't be necessary if we all had adequate vitamin D levels, to the wokest of the woke, enthusiastic, yay science medfluencers all endorsing taking vitamin D. But for anyone as world-weary as me in the medical profession who has followed the research surrounding vitamin D for the last few decades, the belief in vitamin D as an apparent panacea long predates COVID, and it is, at this point, nothing short of a religion. Indeed, you can find papers suggesting it plays a critical role in any illness whatsoever. Seriously, if you go to PubMed and search, you will find an utterly bewildering number of studies purporting to show vitamin D is central to their pathophysiology. In summary, this is because low vitamin D levels are common, and they absolutely are associated with poor outcomes in almost any disease you can think of. If you look at the most severely affected patients with COVID or any infection, frailty in the elderly, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, diabetes, depression, you will find without fail that the sickest patients have lower vitamin D levels than those who are less severely affected. So it doesn't seem unreasonable to conclude that low vitamin D might predispose to severe infection or you know, whatever you're looking at. However, this is bias number one, the causality bias, or simply the mantra, correlation is not causation. From simply observing low vitamin D levels, we cannot say if that is a causal risk factor or simply a bystander. The only way you can figure that out is by prospective, i.e. going forward in time, randomized controlled trials, and in every case, after an observational study suggesting that it could be a causal uh, agent, hundreds of trials replacing vitamin D has not been shown to change the outcome. And yet the believers will not change their minds. They love the D. They want you to have the D. Then comes bias number two which is, of course, the subject of this video, the mechanistic bias. They will come out with some bio-plausible pathway by which vitamin D could be implicated in causing the disease in question. For COVID, I endured long Twitter threads or just shouty assertions that vitamin D's role in the immune system is why people with low vitamin D levels are more susceptible. So let's try to steel man the argument for vitamin D supplementation and analyze the absolute best case scenario where it is most likely to have an effect, bones. Vitamin D is central to normal bone development and maintenance by increasing the absorption of calcium and magnesium, phosphate, things like that. Even the most skeptical of vitamin D doubters would concede that supplementing vitamin D must reduce fractures. And yet the five-year vital study showed no effect of vitamin D supplementation over an inert placebo. Further substudies have shown no effect on outcomes like heart disease or inflammatory conditions or cancer as well. All right, well, perhaps treating middle-aged and older adults has missed the boat. What about children, where bone is literally being grown and children, childhood diseases like rickets, which is caused by uh, low vitamin D, are still found around the world? Surely a study of children who are found to be vitamin D deficient should show a benefit from vitamin D supplementation. 
Well, in a study published just last month, no effect from supplementation was found on the height, weight or pubertal development of almost 9,000 children who were vitamin D deficient, including those profoundly low in vitamin D. And I could already read the comments explaining why this study or that study wasn't valid, the wrong dose, the wrong time. There's always a problem. The believers will never stop believing in taking vitamin D supplements. At some point, you surely have to see the amassed evidence in its entirety. If you are not satisfied by multiple prospective randomized control trials, the gold standard of medical evidence on hundreds of thousands of people, then you're simply not interested in learning the truth. And in most cases, I believe this is due to the mechanistic bias. Okay, so what is actually going on? Well, a low vitamin D is not the cause of all these things. It's a marker of overall health. It's a bystander. People with low vitamin D are more likely to be housebound, so they don't get outside, they don't get sunlight, they're more likely to have poorer diets and be malnourished. It is a sign that they are more frail and hence why it is associated with poorer outcomes in everything. You might wonder why vitamin A or C and B vitamins being given to malnourished children in parts of Africa, for example, are so effective at preventing blindness, scurvy, beriberi, and things like that. Remember, vitamin D isn't actually a vitamin. It's technically a pre-hormone and very different in the way it works and how it's produced. We can't produce other vitamins, but we can produce vitamin D. The vitamin label is an accident of history and rather confuses things. What my inference from this would be is not that vitamin D itself is not important, quite the contrary, but that supplements don't work. Instead, the focus should be on getting outside, getting some sun, exercise, eating good food, which offers you all the macro and micronutrients you need rather than shelling out money on supplements. Something I found very confusing during COVID was the believers in the cult allege that doctors refuse to think about vitamin D, which is amusing because Doctors test for vitamin D almost all the time these days, and as summarized in a text message from a uh, GP friend here, sometimes it's just really useful to have a placebo. If you're new to the channel, you might think that I am unfairly critical of medical influences or alternative medicine. Yet another doctor beholden to Big Pharma. Well, step right up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the circus of medical mishaps. The next section could literally be days long. You'll be pleased to know that it isn't. But I'm going to list some of my favorite examples of great ideas in medicine that had beautiful mechanistic arguments that sounded incredibly convincing, bioplausible. Maybe they worked to treat in mice. And indeed, they convinced doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, and of course, patients that they work. So I'm going to keep it brief with a whistle stop tour of the graveyard of medical therapies, except some of them live on as zombies. Why? because people just believe. Plus, some of them make doctors a lot of money. You've had some D, now jump in the C. Yes, from vitamin D to C. Vitamin C has been the great hope pre for preventing severe sepsis, which is when an infection escalates to a body-wide phenomenon and it carries a significant chance of death. And when you're dealing with something like that, which is quite catastrophic, you can kind of sympathize with wanting to try anything. In vitro experiments, i.e. pre-human lab tests, have shown vitamin C has a critical role in cellular mechanisms related to the development of sepsis. And yet, even though we've been giving vitamin C for years, well, you guessed it, we've not shown any encouraging results in real life. But like vitamin D, supplementing vitamin C is fairly harmless, so it continues on just in case. Staying on the subject of sepsis, in 2001, the FDA approved an Eli Lilly drug called Zygris for sepsis, the first medication available for the condition. So of course it was big news. Zygris is activated protein C, which is an enzyme in humans involved in inflammation as well as in clotting. Eli Lilly had funded the prowess 
trial, which showed it to be very effective, to have a big effect. It rapidly made its way onto guidelines being recommended even more strongly in, for severe sepsis than things like fluid or antibiotics, which are mainstays of treatment. A lot of medics weren't too sure, but Eli Lilly pro promoted it very aggressively, hiring a PR company to handle a multi-pronged approach, including spreading awareness of sepsis, campaigns, enlisting prominent doctors, and so on. Zygris cost $8,000 a pop, and the backdrop of this is that Eli Lilly's blockbuster drug, Prozac, or fluoxetine, the real cash cow, had just lost its patent, meaning that overall profits had fallen by almost a quarter. It was only when three doctors published an analysis of the prowess st study some years later, showing it to be seriously flawed, and also highlighting the unusual PR strategy of Eli Lilly, that questions started to be asked. And after 10 years on the market, during which time, by the way, it remained profitable, Zygris was removed. The intensive care unit has been a place where many therapies have gone to die. We cooled patients for years after cardiac arrest, because it was felt that this reduces inflammation and preserves brain function. It was bio-plausible until we realized it didn't work. We used to give high flow oxygen for most things, such as heart attacks. A lack of oxygen's bad. Oxygen's good, right? So more must be better, except it wasn't. And that was probably because of oxidative stress, damage actually caused by reactive oxygen species. So then we thought, maybe if we give antioxidants uh, and supplementation, that will help with oxidative stress. And what do you know, it actually increased death. On the subject of ventilation, we used to think that moving more air in and out of sick patients' lungs made sense when they were intubated, until we realized we were actually causing more damage that way. The mantra when I was working in ITU was still something called early goal-directed therapy, which was a system of almost ruthlessly correcting a number of parameters, such as blood pressure or urine output, to certain sort of super physiological um, targets, but it fell out of fashion because it became clear that it wasn't really any better than conventional therapy. Then, moving on to my own field of cardiology, which is often described as the most evidence-based specialty, which I think is true, but it's also where some of the most spectacular fails have come. One that's very famous is the Cardiac Arrhythmia Suppression Trial, or CAST, which was in the 1980s. Cardiac patients used to just keep dying on a regular basis. A lot of you watching might not realize how recent a lot of my field is. Back in the 80s, many, many patients died at young ages from heart attacks that I can treat very routinely now. So researchers were looking at heart attack patients that had died and identified that many had extra heartbeats called ectopics. So it was assumed that these were causing cardiac arrest by mucking around with the electrics of the heart and it made perfect mechanistic sense to obliterate these extra beats with medications. And indeed, that's what happened. Patients were given drugs to suppress those extra beats, and they worked very well. Those extra beats were successfully obliterated, and people thought this was having a great effect. Only it turned out that the death rate in the group that received the medications was almost four times higher than the group that got the placebo yet another example of why it's sometimes good to be in the placebo arm. Again, a false causation had been attributed to the extra ectopic beats, which are actually incredibly common, and like low vitamin D levels, they were a bystander. But we didn't learn our lesson, and about 20 years ago, a drug called Neseratide was approved, which was a recombinant version of a hormone released by the heart in response to fluid overload, and a study uh, came out showing that this Johnson & Johnson a new drug improved a very specific test, um, which is an invasively measured blood pressure reading. Um, and that's what the headline was, that it reduced this test by a couple of millimeters of mercury, if memory serves. And so a lot of people weren't actually that convinced that this was that useful. But it was pushed through, and it remained on the market for many years, and a lot of people prescribed it before being removed because it did diddly squat. And this one brings an additional lesson about surrogate endpoints, like this esoteric measurement that it promised to improve. No patient walks into clinic and says, Doc, please can you reduce my pulmonary capillary wedge pressure by two millimeters of mercury? They say, Doc, can you improve my breathing? Or they simply want to live longer. Those are 
more useful clinical endpoints. The most commonly performed medical procedure in the world about two decades ago was coronary angioplasty, which many of you will know as stenting. In countries where you bill per procedure, such as the United States, cardiologists became the highest paid doctors. The stuff I do most of the time, and indeed what I enjoy, is acute treatment. So these are patients who've come in as emergencies with heart attacks. And stents in that situation are life-saving, and indeed one of the best interventions we have in sort of modern medicine that have sent death rates plummeting. But most stenting in that golden era for cardiologists was for stable patients, not emergencies. And this is where the mechanistic fallacy can be so powerful. A patient sees a cardiologist, they do an angiogram and find that there's a tight narrowing in one of the arteries supplying the heart. It makes complete sense to open that narrowing up and restore normal blood flow, right? I mean, it was so obvious that nobody even bothered to check for decades. And yet, well, I feel you might be getting bored with the pattern in this video, stenting stable coronary disease on the whole doesn't extend the life, nor does it do a better job of alleviating symptoms than simple tablets. I'm going to talk about this uh, in more detail in another video, so I'm going to move on. From hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women, which caused more breast cancer and heart disease, I talked about that in a previous video, to clearing amyloid plaques for Alzheimer's, which hasn't really worked, or for ultrafiltration of fluid for heart failure, knee arthroscopy, treatments for pulmonary fibrosis, high frequency ventilatory oscillation, the list goes on and on and on. Time and time again, we fall into the mechanistic trap. You all know wacky medical therapies from the olden days, lobotomies and bloodletting or something crazy. But I wanted to choose recent examples from within most of our lifetimes, when our understanding of physiology was so much better than those primitive medics who were believing in four humours and stuff like that, and yet we still massively overestimated our mastery of human mechanisms. A study published this year looked at almost two and a half thousand Cochrane reviews, which are regarded as the gold standard of medical evidence, published in the last 15 years. It found only 6% of interventions met all the criteria for high quality evidence and a statistically significant positive effect. Harms were only measured in about a third of interventions, and the paper concludes simply, more than nine out of 10 healthcare interventions studied within recent Cochrane reviews are not supported by high quality evidence and harms are underreported. Pretty damning. So what's the unifying theme here? The therapies I've mentioned, which obviously are just a drop in the ocean, cover all forms of treatment, from medications to operations, diets to devices, and yet they have something in common. They didn't deliver, which makes them like most things in medicine. If your pre-test assumption for any new medical treatment is that it doesn't work, you will be right most of the time. I see threads from productivity or performance, health, influencer type people, people like neuroscientist Andrew Huberman, uh, which are the most prescriptive schedules for the day to maximise various different pseudoscientific or half-baked concepts. Every one of his podcast episodes goes into incredible depth about all manner of health topics that would be truly remarkable for one person to be an expert in, in often tremendously precise and certain ways, as if what he's saying is categorically proven. And yet, instead of citing good quality evidence-based studies, the assertions and recommendations rely on belief in mechanisms. If you spend time trying to dive into the citations, you will find an enormous leap from what has been published to what is being claimed. And yet, people like him, um, Rhonda Patrick's another example, they report these often utterly useless studies without any critical appraisal. On the subject of diet, I highly recommend following Dr. Kevin Klatt, PhD, who's a molecular metabolism researcher and a registered dietitian, who put it uh, very nicely in a post. Non-evidence-based recommendations 
often sound infinitely more sciencey or cutting edge or sexy than evidence-based recommendations. It's so much cooler to be talking about how a therapy supposedly influences signaling events, metabolism, organismal physiology to influence disease than it does to say that well-conducted, repeatable, randomized controlled trials clearly demonstrate an expected disease risk reduction. We've seen the proliferation of a lot of MD and PhD scientists with great enthusiasm for science communication and understanding of how the body works Works, pumping out health and wellness advice to the masses in a coincidentally profitable way, the heart of their messaging lacks a grounding in the principles of evidence-based medicine and clinical sciences, which is consistent with most not having any training in it. The reason they're saying things not in medical guidelines is not because they've stumbled into unique medical knowledge, but rather they have no ruler by which to grade evidence other than whether they find it to sound plausibly true themselves and maybe if it does something in a mouse or a petri dish. This uninhibited or bias-driven approach allows you to keep generating content to fuel the wellness influencer role and inevitably takes you down a path of needing to be hyped about every promising new study despite one out of every few hundred basic science findings even making it through phase one trials. We need to make try this therapy because it's been repeatedly shown to work in well-designed randomized controlled trials with meaningful outcomes the sexy norm over try this therapy because it's anti-inflammatory or good for your microbiome or insert sexy buzzword of the day here. If someone is pitching you the latter, ask about what clinical evidence supports the therapy, what outcomes were measured, what the effect size is, what risks you might expect, and what metrics you should use to determine whether trying something is successful. Damn, that's kind of this whole video summarized in two minutes. A beautiful demonstration of this super sciencey magic formula trope was on display in a recent viral Twitter thread about a blueprint that allegedly made a multimillionaire reduce their biological age. My friend Andrew Steele, who's another uh, PhD, uh, he's a longevity researcher and author, and he did a brilliant job breaking down each claim in a video, but his conclusion summarizes things more succinctly than I ever could. And I really think this gets to the nub of this entire health, wellness, biohacking, fad diet, biological age measuring situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. It's all about marketing rather than health. Because there are these promising measures of biological age and there are things that you can do to improve your health. But the way that you get 10,000 retweets isn't by saying, eat well, exercise and get a bit of sleep. It's by giving highly specific, scientific sounding, spuriously precise advice, making your followers feel like they're getting some kind of exclusive insight that isn't available anywhere else. My slightly less erudite response when I was tagged in the thread was, wow, a multimillionaire who exercises regularly and eats healthily is in good physical condition. I am shocked, I tell you, shocked. And that's the lie behind 90% of health influencer mumbo jumbo. The things that have evidence, the things that do work, are not glamorous. They're common sense. Eat well, sleep well, exercise. Maybe you don't build a social media career saying that boring stuff or explaining evidence-based guidelines. No, you need to make a career misinterpreting every garbage study about something exciting in the journal of pointless nonsense or offer an exclusive deal to purchase the supplements that will change everything. It's tempting to look for some scientific reason that a certain thing makes you feel fantastic. But you don't have to. It's fine to say having a sauna feels great without invoking heat shock proteins and metabolic pathways. You don't need science to hold your hand for everything you do. You know, this phenomenon of having something great but allowing your attention to be drawn from reality into fanciful abstraction applies to so many areas of human nature. I think you could make an argument for applying it to crypto, where the mechanics, the promise, is amazing. It sounds really good, but the application has so far been disappointing. People can get carried away with the hypothetical potential of something far into the future rather than concentrating on real results that can be accomplished in the here and now. It's that time of year when a lot of us think about helping others, which is wonderful, but it can be difficult figuring out how you can make the most impact. 
How will the money you are generously donating be used? How much good will it do? GiveWell spends over 40,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact evidence-backed opportunities that they found. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than a billion dollars and evidence that you can look at yourself suggests that these donations will save 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. Some years ago I spent time working in rural South Africa and the burden of infectious disease on people, often children, in many parts of the African continent is hard to comprehend. Hundreds of thousands of people die every year from malaria, most of them under the age of five. And that's why I'm choosing GiveWell's Top Charities Fund, which has identified charities most likely to make the biggest impact, which are charities like the Malaria Consortium, Helen Keller International, fighting to ensure fewer people die or lose their sight from preventable disease. And what I particularly like about GiveWell is that uh, checking out their research is completely free. They publish all of their research and recommendations on their website, freely available without any sign up. And they've even got this section here, which is called Our Mistakes, where they list ways that they feel that they could have done better. And wouldn't it be nice if everyone was so transparent? Just like I say on this channel regularly about the importance of making informed decisions about health, GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high impact giving as well. They allocate your tax deductible donation to the charity or fund that you choose without taking a cut. If this is your first time donating through GiveWell, you can have your donation matched up to $100 if you give before the end of the year. If you want to make sure that your money really helps somebody living in poverty, Go to givewell.org forward slash medlife or go to givewell.org, choose YouTube and type medlife crisis. I'm really glad to be working with GiveWell and to promote them. And I'm really grateful to you for listening and hopefully making someone's life a little bit better. Happy Christmas if you celebrate it. Happy holidays if you don't. Whatever you're up to, I wish you well as the year draws to an end. I'll see you soon.